With that, Jeff, I think we are ready to get started. My name is Jeff Anderson, and I am the founder of the law firm Jeff Anderson and Associates. Now for 38 years, over 38 years, I and our firm have had the privilege of working with and advocating for survivors of sexual abuse across the country. Today, our focus is on New York. Today, we have posted and are releasing, and we'll be discussing in a few moments, another Anderson report. This is now the 22nd Anderson Report that has been released to help identify perils in the communities, to help survivors know where they are and who they are, to identify those institutions and Catholic bishops across this country who have been complicit in allowing children to have been abused, and to do what we can with each survivor one at a time to make sure that we are doing something today to protect kids tomorrow. New York report. Before I discuss it, I'd like to offer a couple disclaimers. Our analysts have assembled data from the state of New York and thus digested and now reporting and posted online and on our website at andersonadvocates.com all the data I'm discussing at, at this time. And under the Child Victims Act, survivors in New York have been given an opportunity to have a voice, to bring a claim as a Jane Doe or a John Doe or using the name if they choose, and to sue the offender and those that have enabled the offenses to have occurred. Our firm has been involved in and representing survivors in New York for many decades. And until the Child Victims Act passed, they weren't given a chance to have this voice, to take this action, to m cause a measure of accountability and expose the offenders and those that allowed them to occur. We assembled the data under the Child Victims Act and all the public data, data, public data that has been uh, uh, now publicly available. And our analysts have now looked at every single civil suit filed against every Catholic diocese across the state. And we will be discussing that here today and available on our website. It, it recites all the lawsuits that have been filed against individual perpetrators and against the diocese in New York. The vast majority of the claims against these individuals and identities have not been fully evaluated in a civil or criminal court. These are simply the filings, the civil filings of the complaints themselves and the information contained in that public data. Thus, the allegations can't and should not be considered proved or substantiated until done so uh, by adjudication, by settlement, or in a court of law. New York.
from the opening of the Child Victims Act on August the 13th, uh, 2019, we and our analysts have evaluated the data in every single civil case filed against the Catholic diocese or Catholic clergy across the state. That data has been assembled up until December 31st. So any cases filed after December 31st are not included in the data that we will be sharing here today. And as soon as that data is digested and um, excavated, that will be released. But this is from August 13th of 2019 to December 31st. The civil suits, that is the civil complaints that have been filed across the entire state involving the Catholic Church in New York, the total number of civil complaints filed alleging childhood sexual abuse are 2,801 civil complaints filed. 2,801. Of that number, our firm is privileged to stand with and work for uh, so far until December 31st, 1,007 of that number, which represents 36% of the cases filed by the courageous survivors one at a time. Of the total alleged perpetrators identified in the civil complaints involving the Catholic Church in New York, there are 1,427 priests, brothers, and lay teachers identified. There are clergy perpetrators of those identified by uh, name to be 1,135 clergy. That would be priests, nuns, brothers. There are 299 of that number that are lay people. The positions of alleged perpetrators identified in the complaints who are priests are 959. Statewide. There are five top alleged perpetrators identified in the complaints statewide that we have teased out. Number one, Father Francis Vogt in the Diocese of Rochester. 52 com civil complaints filed to date. Second, Rudy Tremble Alari, a coach uh, in the Archdiocese of New York, 32 civil complaints filed. Third, Edwin Ted Gaynor, gym teacher coach in the Archdiocese School, an Archdiocese School of New York. Fourth, Father Robert O'Neill in the Diocese of Rochester. 26 civil lawsuits filed. Should also be notable and credit given to 11 survivors with whom we worked with, courageous survivors uh, who brought suit over 15 years ago against the Diocese of Rochester 
and O'Neill and exposed him and them for the serious practices employed. Those cases and all 11 of them were dismissed and they were thrown out on the statute of limitations. We were honored to stand with those survivors almost 20 years ago. Uh, the courthouse doors were shut then. They've now been opened under the Child Victims Act and now there are 26 uh, cases filed against Father Robert O'Neill, many of whom uh, the survivors that the Jane Doe's and John Doe's whom we represent uh, are among them. The fifth is Father Donald W. Becker from the Diocese of Buffalo, 24 lawsuits filed. I now want to talk about the eight dioceses and break this down by diocese. Beginning with uh, the Archdiocese of New York, the total number of complaints filed involving the Archdiocese of New York are 710. Of that number, we represent 207 of those survivors, which is 29% of those filed. The alleged perpetrators identified in the lawsuits involving the Archdiocese of New York total 400. Clergy, 295. Of those, priests and bishops, 236. The top five alleged perpetrators identified in the complaints involving the Archdiocese of New York are Rudy Tremoroli, a coach, 32. Edwin Ted Gaynor, coach teacher, 26. Brother Salvatore Farrell, 19. Father Ralph LaBelle, 13. Michael O'Hara, 11. The institutions most frequently identified in the complaints filed are Our, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Church and School, 46 complaints naming 10 different perp alleged perpetrators. Cardinal Hayes High School, 19 complaints uh, numbering uh, and naming 10 alleged perpetrators. And Monsignor Farrell High School, 14 complaints uh, naming six alleged perpetrators. Among those, at both Cardinal Hayes School and Monsignor Farrell High School, there are 16, it looks like, cases alleging childhood sexual abuse against Monsignor John Paddock. And we had the privilege to serve and stand with Joe Caramano, a survivor who came forward um, uh, uh, anonymously originally and identified Paddock as his offender. And as a result of that, he was the first to identify Paddock publicly while Paddock was in a parish in the Archdiocese of New York. And since that time, we now have seen no less than 15 cases naming Paddock, the courage of one survivor. Joseph Caramano, formerly John Doe. I'd like to turn next to the Diocese of Brooklyn. The total number of complaints filed in the Diocese of Brooklyn are 571. Of that number, we are privileged to represent 127 survivors who have filed, which is 22% of the total. 
The alleged perpetrators identified in the lawsuits involving the Diocese of Brooklyn total uh, 301, of which 229 are clergy, of which 183 are priests. The five top alleged perpetrators identified in the civil suits brought through December are number one, Father Romano Ferraro, 18. Father Romano Ferraro has been on our radar against whom we have brought cases and have known about across many states, not just in New York, for many years and there's more about him uh, on a website and a video that details that history there. The second is Father Harold Cox, 11. The third is Father Henry McLeod, 10. The fourth is James Grace Jr., a layperson, nine. Fourth, or fifth is Father Robert Farrow, F-E-R-R-O, nine in number. The institutions frequently identified in the complaints involving the Diocese of Brooklyn, most frequently are St. Francis Preparatory School, 21, nine alleged perpetrators, St. Benedict's Joseph, excuse me, St. Benedict Joseph Labray Church and School, 13, with eight perpetrators alleged, and St. Vincent's Services, 10 complaints filed, three perpetrators alleged. I'm gonna turn now to the Diocese of Rockville Center uh, in which the Catholic Bishop there made the choice to file for reorganization and or chapter 11. Um, nonetheless, um, I'm going to give the details of the suits that have been brought and the information that needs to be known. Um, Diocese of Rockville Center, total number of complaints filed involving the Diocese of Rockville Center, 228. Of that number, we represent and stand with 71 survivors, which represents 31% of those filed through December. The total alleged perpetrators identified in the complaints involving Rockville Center is 144. The alleged clergy perpetrators is 121. The priests uh, of that number are 99. And the six top alleged perpetrators identified in the complaints filed um, against Diocese of Rockville Center are one, Father Albert Soave, 14, two, Father Charles Rabato, 12, three, Father John Maloney, six, four, Father Robert Brown, six, and uh, finally, uh, Father William Burke, six. The institutions uh, most frequently identified in civil filings are St. Hugh of Lincoln, Roman Catholic Church, 12 complaints, and Holy Trinity Diocesan High School, nine complaints. Those involve mostly Soave and Rabato. I'm going to turn now to um, the Diocese of Syracuse. And before I do, it has to be noted and will be emphasized here today that there is a shortened bar date there because they filed for reorganization in which the court has shortened the time frame in which a survivor can assert a claim against the diocese. And there is eight days left on that time frame until April 15th. We will emphasize that again, survivors and family members, to let folks know the time is short.
the clock is ticking and there are eight days left in which to assert your rights against the Diocese of Syracuse for their role in the sexual abuse by clergy. Syracuse. There's a total number of complaints filed against the Diocese of Syracuse, 157. Of those, we represent 66, which is 42% of all those filed. The total alleged perpetrators identified in the complaints involving the Diocese of Syracuse are 89. 72 clergy perpetrators alleged. Priests and bishop, 68. The top five alleged perpetrators identified in the complaints involving the Diocese of Syracuse are Father Edward Madore, 10, James Francis Pertell, layperson, teacher, 10, Father Daniel Casey, 9, Father Thomas Neary, 8, and Father e Charles Eckerman, 6. The top three institutions involve Seton Catholic High School, 13, Notre Dame High School, 5, Bishop Cunningham High School, another five. Overall, we represent, to date, 105 survivors, but have so far filed 66 of those cases and, were, and are working on the balance and encouraging the survivors, pertaining to the imploring the, diocese, the survivors in Syracuse to come forward in the remaining days um, immediately, there are eight days left. I'm going to turn now to the Diocese of Albany. The total complaints filed involving the Diocese of Albany are 266. Of those, we represent 127, which is uh, 48%. Alleged perpetrators identified in the suits filed uh, are 145. The alleged clergy perpetrators in Albany are 118. Of those are priests and or bishops are, one, are 93. And the top six perpetrators identified in civil complaints filed through December are number one, Father Joseph Romano, 18. Two, Brother Clement Murphy, 13. Three, Brother James Vincent Haney, 12, a religious order priest, had working in several dioceses, including Albany, who's been on our radar and um, uh, for a long time. Fourth, uh, Father Alan Jupin, seven. Fifth, Father Gary McCure, or McCure. And sixth, Bishop Howard Hubbard, having been the bishop there since 1977, seven civil complaints filed against him for childhood sexual abuse. The top institutions uh, are Notre Dame Bishop Gibbons High School, 23 complaints, LaSalle School, and St. Paul Apostle Parish and School. The next is the Diocese of Ogdensburg. And the total complaints filed there uh, so far are 80, 47 of which we represent the survivors, uh, which is 59% so far. There is a total number of alleged perpetrators identified in those complaints of 39, and uh, 38 of which are clergy, um, 36 of which are priests, and the top 
alleged uh, uh, perpetrators in terms of numbers there are Father John Fallon, Father Liam Adorty, Father Lalonde, Father Plant, or Plant, and Father Franklin. The top institutions are Church of Holy Angels and St. Anne's Church. Turning to Buffalo and the Diocese of Buffalo, they also have filed for reorganization. That is chapter 11. And there, there's a total number of complaints filed involving the Diocese of Buffalo so far of 498 through December. Of that number, we stand with and represent 240 courageous survivors, which is 48% of the total that have come forward. The total number of alleged perpetrators identified in those complaints in the Diocese of Buffalo uh, are 244. 213 of which are clergy, and 205 of which are priests. The top five perpetrators named in the Diocese of Buffalo numerically so far are Father Donald W. Becker, 24, Father Fred Fingerly, 21, Father Norman Norbert or Solitus, 17, Father Basil Ormsby, 14, and Monsignor James Hayes, 13. Top institutions, Bishop Turner High School, Bishop Turner Carroll High School, 12 complaints, and the All Saints Roman Catholic Church and High School, where both Fingerly and Hayes are alleged to have abused uh, out of. We identify not just the offenders and not just the diocese, uh, but the top uh, parishes uh, and or locations where the abuses are alleged to have occurred so that more light can be put on um, this uh, dark saga. Finally, and the eighth diocese is that of the Diocese of Rochester. And in New York, the first to have filed, the first bishop in Rochester to have filed for reorganization, also called Chapter 11. The total number of complaints filed against the Diocese of Rochester are 316. Of that, we represent 122 individual survivors which is 39% of those that had filed. The alleged perpetrators identified pertaining to Rochester, the total is 126. Of those cler our clergy are 105, and of those our pri priests are 91. And so when we say clergy, that could mean priests, brothers, nuns. And then when we say priest, the word referring specifically just to the priest. That's 91 there. The top six alleged perpetrators identified are number one, Father Francis Vogt, 52 cases. Two, Father Robert O'Neill, 26. Three, the same Robert O'Neill, who many years ago was on our radar. Uh, three, Father Joseph Larrabee, 19. Four, this is a different Robert O'Neill, excuse me. In, in Rochester, it's a different Robert O'Neill. That's no, the same one that I referred to earlier. Okay, because there's two Robert O'Neills, it's the same one. Um, I, I mentioned Father Joseph Larrabee, and then Al Kassan, and Father Eugene Emo. The top institutions named most frequently in the complaints are number one, St. Thomas Aquinas Institute, or the Aquinas Institute, 14, 
St. Boniface Church and School, 11. St. John the Evangelist, 12. And at St. Boniface and at St. John the Evangelist, uh, O'Neill is named, among others, at both of those locations, having worked at both of those locations and allegedly abused at both of those locations. Why did we create this website? Why did we create this database? And why was this analysis done? And continue to be done. First, the peril exists, both past and present. And the only way it can be abated is to put light on it and thus create heat. Heat that could never before be created or light that could be spotlighted until the Child Victims Act allowed these civil suits to be brought by survivors anonymously or otherwise if they choose. Second, it has been assembled, digested, analyzed, and now posted and organized so that we can alert all the communities across the state and across the country and inform the survivors, many of whom, or most of whom, suffer in silence, thinking they're the only ones, of not only who the identities are of those offenders accused, but where they are accused to have offended, and what Catholic dioceses and or uh, institutions are implicated in those offenses. And finally, we've made this a usable database that is both dynamic and effective for navigating and uh, researching the information to help survivors come forward and be a part of protecting other kids in the future. Mike Finnegan, my partner and colleague, is going to share the dashboard with you and uh, how to use it for easy access, and I'll be back up. Hi, I'm Mike Finnegan, one of the attorneys with Jeff Anderson Associates. And before I get to the dashboard, uh, I wanted to go back to uh, 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 one of the places here that we talked about early on. Uh, can you go to the, the Archdiocese of New York? Down. Keep going. Right here. Yep. Go back. Uh, so one of the things that got mentioned here, I think we had a, a name that may have been wrong at the outset, uh, but Bruce Ritter is one of the um, people that's been accused in uh, a number of lawsuits, one of the top five in the Archdiocese of New York. And he was a prolific perpetrator at the Covenant House, a homeless shelter that he started for teens in the Archdiocese of New York and has now been named in 11 uh, lawsuits. And then can you go to the places too, Drew? And one of the other things I wanted to just uh, clear up is on uh, Monsignor John Paddock, there have been a number of accusers that have come forward against him. There are eight lawsuits, eight total lawsuits that involve him. And so he was at both Cardinal Hayes High School and Monsignor Farrell High School. Uh, and he was involved in both those, but all of those lawsuits do not involve him. There are eight lawsuits with Monsignor John Paddock. And there were other accused offenders at those locations as well. Okay, let's go to the, uh, the dashboard if we can. Yeah, and I want to emphasize this dashboard, uh, we created it and have been working on it for a long time. This is available on our website at www.andersonadvocates.com. And all this data is there, all this information is there. And so what we did is, uh, this has two primary features to it. One is a summary data by diocese and statewide. And so what this, this piece up here does on the, on the summary data by diocese is allows anybody that goes on here to be able to look at the statewide numbers, which Jeff Anderson had mentioned is 2,801 lawsuits filed. This also has the number of statewide alleged perpetrators. Gives more information down here about, about the type of offenders 
alleged offenders that are there. And well, that's going, uh, two of the things about the database that I want to uh, uh, emphasize again uh, is that all of the people that are in the database have been accused in a civil lawsuit. That means that those allegations have not been proven yet and they will be through the process, but they should be considered innocent until proven guilty. And also on the numbers overall, uh, we did our very best to go through, comb through the data, comb through all of the lawsuits, analyze all of that, but there are still times where some of the, some of the names that are in lawsuits are misspelled or they may have a partial name that says Father Ryan. And so there are times that those will get counted as more than one alleged perpetrator within this set. But we did our best to uh, analyze it, research it, and any that we, could, that we could find that were the same person, we could identify that, we, uh, we made that, that change in here. Uh, and so if we go back up to the top, the other uh, feature of this is that you can search by alleged perpetrator. And what this page allows you to do is filter by diocese. So what that means is you can press Diocese of Syracuse, which has a bankruptcy bar date of April 15th in less than two weeks. You can press that and that will give us all of the alleged perpetrators that have been accused in those lawsuits in the Diocese of Syracuse right here. It'll list all of those people. It'll also allow you to filter by rule. So if you wanted to see statewide all of the seminarians or deacons that have been accused, those boxes can get checked and then we'll see all of the seminarians, deacons. And then the last feature, uh, which is extremely powerful as well, is uh, what this allows you to do is search for somebody's name and that name uh, will come up and tell you uh, details about the complaints again. So we just searched right there, we searched John Paddock, we searched the name Paddock. What that gave us is that he's in the Archdiocese of New York. The earliest reported abuse in the complaints is 1987 and the last reported abuse in the complaints is 2003. And this also gives us the number of lawsuits that Monsignor Paddock has been accused in, and that's eight. And so it's a, an extremely powerful dashboard database that we've created for the community, for safety, and also for survivors to be able to use this and find information about the lawsuits that have been filed so far in New York. Mike Finnegan mentioned uh, Father Bruce Ritter, who had not been mentioned earlier. And I wanted to underscore something there because it represents um, the significance of the opportunity now given survivors uh, to take action, to have a voice, to share it privately, and to bring a civil suit in New York the way they couldn't before. Because in 1991, I represented survivors of Father Bruce Ritter, the founder of the Covenant House. And Daryl Basile, who did go public at that time, had the courage to stand up against him and the Archdiocese and the Franciscans, I believe, and identify him for a long history of abuse. And that case, like that per pertaining to others, including O'Neill and others, were thrown out of the courts statutes of limitations. That statute opened and the window is opened in Syracuse now against the Diocese of Syracuse for eight days in New York until August 13th in the rest of the state. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to finish up by saying um, uh, and first and most important there is limited time for every survivor to share his or her voice and every survivor to know that they can share that secret and do so privately and bring a civil action as a John Doe or as a Jane Doe and preserve that privacy and have the opportunity to have that voice heard, to name that offender and hold those accountable uh, through a civil action. Um, um, and thus be a part of protecting other kids. Second, I think it's really important that this 
database also uh, be created and, and, and navigated and available to the survivors, to law enforcement, uh, to other attorneys working with, and, uh, with survivors alongside us to help assemble the evidence, to prove the cases, and coordinate uh, those efforts. And absent this, um, it becomes a far greater challenge. And the third thing I want to emphasize is the time limits. Syracuse, there are eight days left. Eight days. You have to call now. We hear you. We believe you. It's time. Across the state of New York, there are 128 days left. We also know, having worked in this space for decades, all of our professionals and all of our attorneys are trauma-informed. We also understand every survivor, most every survivor, especially by clergy, have suffered in silence and carried this secret in shame for decades. But now is the time. And the time is ticking. And that clock is ticking. So it's time for action, it's time for truth, it's time for reckoning. It's time for you also to know that you can be believed and you can do something about it. And we're there to help. And to every survivor that has come forward and every survivor that does, it's an act of courage. And we're grateful to you knowing that you have made a difference in protecting other kids in the future and helping other survivors come forward and share their secret to get help, to have hope, and bring healing. The law in New York has opened it up for survivors. It's time for survivors to be heard and kids to be protected. Thank you. Uh, the question on whether they will be filing is really uh, their decision to make. Uh, they have been using Chapter 11 in New York and in New Jersey and elsewhere as a shield and thus a sword to protect themselves from having their, their secrets disclosed and uh, to avoid a, a true reckoning. And so far, four in the, uh, New York have filed, and whether or not others are going to follow remains to be seen, but one thing is, uh, is immutably true, and that is that the, it's time for the survivors to come forward and bring claims, whether it's in or out of reorganization, and uh, file the suits against the offenders and those that held them accountable, and it's very possible other dioceses will follow the lead of the diocese b a bishop in Rochester, uh, Buffalo, Syracuse, and Rockville Center, all of whom have already filed for reorganization. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question comes from Celia. She asks, is anyone advocating that the time limit should be further extended because of the pandemic lasting over a year? I think the uh, governor and the legislature did extend the statute of limitations. Originally, when passed by the New York legislature, gave survivors one year. And then uh, because of COVID and because there was a legislative realization that that was not enough time for survivors to come forward and there were so many yet to do so, it was extended another year. And so whether or not it gets extended again, I can't say, but I can say that uh, we have to assume 
and it's, high, and it's a high probability that there will not be an extension, and we have to assume and every survivor is operating under the belief with us that we have to act now and we have to file suit now and we have to protect the survivors and we have to identify the offenders and we have to do it now in Syracuse in the next eight days and across the state in the next 120 days. No, they're under, a, they're under the same law right now that applies, and whether or not Brooklyn is going to do anything more by way of reorganization is up to them. Uh, and that bishop, in concert with the uh, Vatican, and if they make that decision, that's theirs to make. It doesn't change what we're going to do. It doesn't change what the survivors can do. And it doesn't change uh, the imperative to take action and come forward. The deadline in Brooklyn right now is August 13th, and it remains to be August 13th, yes. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question is, what kind of documents are you asking for from the Diocese of Rochester? In every diocese, and in every case that we have brought and will bring, um, we will require and seek a full disclosure of all the files maintained by all the bishops in all the dioceses pertaining to the individual offenders and the patterns and practices employed by the Catholic bishops, past and present. And that is a part of what can be done in bringing civil actions. So that applies to Rochester, Buffalo, Rockville Center, Syracuse, and every single diocese, Ogdensburg, New York, Brooklyn, and uh, um, all of them. And so part of civil litigation and the uh, power of a civil suit is it can compel the wrongdoer, and in this case, the Catholic diocese and the current bishops and the top officials to have to come clean with all the secrets they have held in all the documents they have, they have concealed for so long under their very dangerous and perilous practices and adherence to secrecy. So we're in pursuit of those files and hundreds if not thousands of those across the state of New York as we speak. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question comes from Scott. He asks, in general, how long do you expect these cases to take? And how much did the pandemic, de pandemic delay things? Well, in terms of how long the case, the cases in any given place or any individual case takes is always uh, a question that we can't answer today. What we can answer today is there can be an end and there will be to some point in time of the litigation, but it can take as soon as six months, it can take as long as six years, and we can never say today to any individual survivor it's going to take this long. We can say every day to every survivor with whom we work and our whole team works, we are going to do what we can to bring it to speedy and true and just resolution and reckoning uh, and honor your individual needs because some people need, uh, have needs that are different than others and we have to try to honor each individual need and treat each in individual survivor uh, uh, as best we can um, and tailor the legal strategy to his or her circumstances. And many of the survivors, if not most, are over the age of 50 because this is secrets that have been held in shame uh, uh, for so many years. And we're mindful of that. And we're also mindful of the additional pressures that COVID has brought on all, but particularly upon the survivors of trauma and sexual abuse by clergy, particularly those survivors. An additional burden added. Thank you, Jeff. And we have another question from Scott. He asks, have any cases in New York, or I guess it's how many cases in New York State have been settled? I don't have the number of cases that have been settled, um, so I don't, I don't really know. Survivors who have yet to come forward and file a complaint. 
There is no question based on the data that we have assembled, the survivors that have come forward uh, so far, uh, uh, that this is a, still a fraction of those that will, and the numbers need to be, uh, continue to be every single day. Uh, more survivors are aware of the time limits uh, now imposed and the opportunity given them. And uh, I expect uh, and hope that every survivor that gets the word and gets the chance to have a voice and honor that, that truth uh, does come forward and uh, um, get the help and um, know there's a chance and a brighter day and bringing a civil action can uh, bring that end uh, uh, and it, it at least brings some hope and, and really it is about power, the power that survivors didn't have as kids, that now have uh, the power to do something about what they couldn't do as kids, and the law allows them and us and those like us to now take that power and recover it and do something about it. So I expect and hope that every survivor um, in New York can now take advantage of the law there as, as well as in New Jersey and elsewhere and act now and um, give us and others like us a chance to help. Thank you, Jeff. So we've answered all the questions that have been submitted. Now, if there's anyone on the line that would like to unmute at this time and share a question over the phone, please feel free to unmute now and ask your question. Um, I think it's a really good question, and the question is, is, is there any way the bankruptcy court can extend the deadlines uh, for filing? And the answer is no. The power is given the legislature and the law signed into law by the governor, and it is the bankruptcy court that can shorten the deadline, as they did in Syracuse, but the bankruptcy court cannot extend it. So the, the deadline of August 13th, across the state and Syracuse of April 15th is a deadline and currently uh, the law of New York and remains the law of New York. Yes, uh, some have been settled, and um, settlement negotiations in others have uh, begun. And um, working on resolution for the survivors is always a parallel track with working towards uh, conclusion through litigation. And so those two things work in tandem, and uh, bringing a, a speedy resolution and fair resolution is always a high priority and a part of what we do every single day with survivors. and all the questions.
questions over the phone. So I want to thank everyone for attending and participating in today's press event. As noted in our release and on our website, the press conference was filmed at 1080p resolution with a broadcast camera. Video files will be uploaded to Vimeo and available for download following the conclusion of this event for use by broadcast and digital media. This may take up to an hour. A Dropbox link will also be available upon request and you can submit requests to media at andersonadvocates.com. Finally, please feel free to reach out to us directly. I've also provided attorney contact information in the chat window and our media email address. So feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you so much for attending today's event. And gratitude to all the survivors who have come forward and to our entire team for standing with them and me in this shared journey.